Well, before I get into those, I just want to mention that, uh, as you know, on the 21st of March, Ontario is lifting the legal mandates for everything, basically. We'll, we will be able to go mask-free, we'll be able to not worry about distancing, capacity limits, anything. Now, next week is still like this week, so we will still be doing exactly as we're doing now. But what I wanted to mention is, once we go back to what looks normal, it's of incredible importance that we acknowledge the fact that not everybody is at the same place. Not everybody is going to be comfortable going without a mask. Not everybody is going to be comfortable getting too close to people. Not everybody is going to be comfortable even coming back to services yet. And I, I do want to mention this because there is one thing that is more important than either our rights or our safety. <clears throat> and that is our Christ-like love for one another. We can't afford to get this wrong. So no matter where we are on the issue, it's incredibly important that we bear with one another. If somebody's not ready, if you're not ready to come back, then I urge you, find some people you can still be comfortable with and worship the Lord together with them. Spend time in his word with them. Don't forsake assembling with anybody just because you can't be with everybody. Reach out over the phone or online as, as you can. But whether, if, if you're comfortable, don't look down on those who are uncomfortable. And if you're uncomfortable, don't, don't get too worked up about the people who are comfortable. One thing that I've been seeing over the last couple of years, and it has been getting worse, is this tendency to see people who disagree with us as being terrible people. And that's not the way the church is meant to be. The church is where we love one another. The church is where the strong brother and the weak brother, irrespective of what is right, still value each other and try not to cause the other to violate their conscience. Are you with me? Am I making sense here? So let's give each other all the grace we receive <laughs> as, we, as we start integrating back in again, okay? Give people time when they need it. Give people space when they need it. And above all, remember that we're still family with all of one another. We have to get this right. So, other family business, Camp OCA, Ontario Christian Assembly. It's having the annual meeting on the 9th of April at the Westway Church. That's uh, 1 o'clock. I guess that's a, is that a Sunday? Saturday, okay. Now, and on the 20th, oh, sorry, Joel. Okay, cool. That, that could be important. I forget how that works, but if you can't go, you can still vote, I guess. That's, uh, it's important. The camp is also at a critical period, and, uh, but um, it's also a very hopeful time because we're getting close to being able to, to meet. Uh, beginning on the 27th of March, Rico will be back from his tour of Asia Minor, and he's going to begin a series at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings here. Uh, it'll be just over there on the seven churches of Asia Minor, and he's going to have some great visuals. Uh, you know that he loves to document things quite thoroughly, so you're going to see a lot of... Of your, basically, you'll be able to re-experience his visit. And, and I'm telling you, there is nothing like being at a place to help you come to grips with some of the history and, and to, to spend some time on it again. Recognize that you know, the books of the Bible are written to real people in real places. And there is wisdom we can gain by spending some time getting to know the places and people. So now, with that uh, out of the way, you can, uh, if you need a little help remembering these, you can uh, rewind the video a little <laughs> later. But let's focus our attention on the God who makes us family with one another. Let's stand and read together Psalm 
from Psalm chapter 80. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. So let us come in praise to him who is worthy of all praise. that is what we pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts we know lord that the the apostle paul saw that as something to pray for he prayed that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened that we would know you know you better because you are high and lifted up and those who saw you high and lifted up shining in the light of your glory. We're terrified because you are so great and so glorious and so powerful that it was that they could hardly breathe and they fell down and needed strength to be given strength in order just to stand and bear it. 
And yet, Lord, so great is your mercy that you allow us to come into your presence, even such as we are. You welcome us. You welcome us to be part of the temple in which you live by your Spirit. And we thank and praise you for that grace today. In the name of Jesus, who has made it possible. Amen.
Hebrews tells us that the same people, right, who, who had experienced such great successes because God was able and God had given them power to work miracles, some of those same people, it says, were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were sewn into animal skins and forced to fight wild beasts. And it says, of whom the world was not worthy. They all died not having received all that was promised them. And yet they knew that God was able. They knew that there was something waiting for them that was better than anything they had lost here. And so for us, it is exactly the same. We're not always going to look like winners in the eyes of the world, but the one who raised Jesus from the dead is still our God. He is still able, and we still have something better ahead. And so as we go to prayer, let us call out to him and keep ourselves fixed upon him. This is an old favorite of many of us.
morning. During the... I got a wave. <laughs> I'll wave back. During the time that we were singing, I, I kept twisting and turning in my seat. Yeah, I'm that guy. Uh, counting, and I, I think we're up to 43, maybe 44 people. It's good to see you here uh, in person. And it, it is good to be together with you who are watching the video stream at this time as well. It's, it, is, it is good to be together. Um, question on the screen, though, is where I'm starting today. You can see I've got my coffee up here with me. Are you tired? Because <laughs> I tell you, I'm tired. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the very next point in my notes, Bill. <laughs> This is the first day of daylight savings time. I know we, we've just sprung forward and lost one hour of sleep. Wait a minute, Grant, is that why you asked me to preach today? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, if I can get the slide advanced, that would be great. There we go. Works better if they sync up with what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, every, every year... Uh, well, twice a year, actually. We do this again in the fall. I see numerous articles um, pointing out how foolish this practice is. And, and that not only does it not save any energy, which was the original purpose of it, uh, but it actively <laughs> makes things better, worse for us because it impairs our ability to function um, as we're all tired and probably cranky, too. <laughs> There have been numerous legislative proposals in different countries around the world to abandon the practice, but very few of them have actually been enacted. Um, for example, here in Ontario, legislation was passed to stop shifting our clocks around twice a year. If both the province of Quebec and the state of New York do the same thing at the same time. Yeah, good luck <laughs> with that. <laughs> In fact, as I was getting ready this morning, I saw an article, because today is today, about New York considering this idea, and New York has said they'll do it if all the states that border New York do it at the same time as well. Yeah. <laughs> but really, truthfully, the, the, the time change is not why I'm tired. I mean, I, I was tired a long time before this one. <laughs> in, in fact, I usually wake up tired. Um, Waking up feeling rested and refreshed is so odd that I take note of it when it happens. Um, now, I mean, my job as a high school teacher is not very demanding physically, um, but it is quite demanding mentally. And so usually by the end of each day, I come home feeling quite drained. Um, I say to Jenny, I don't know why I'm tired. I didn't do anything. Well, I didn't do anything with my muscles, with my brain. I used it all up. Uh, by the end of the day. Um, but you know, that's really not why I'm tired either. I mean, after all, normal day-to-day -day fatigue is normal. Uh, in creation, God established a day of rest for us. In Genesis 2.2, he tells, he creates the Sabbath. And, and in the law given to Moses, he tells the people of Israel, observe this Sabbath. Keep it as a day of rest. I mean, the weekend was God's idea before it was anyone else's. Of course, these days, most of us seem to fill our weekends with so many activities and that we're, by the time we do go back to work, we're tired anyway. You know, we wear ourselves out at work, and then we wear ourselves out at play. I, and yet, beyond this, we're tired for other reasons as well. Uh, in fact, weary. Weary is a better word for it. Uh, you know, and, and being weary goes beyond just being tired. Um, found this quote from Scott Cochran. Weariness is as much about your soul as it is about your body. It can include having your emotional, relational, and yes, spiritual tanks emptied out. And we are running on empty. For a whole lot of reasons. Some of them are going to be personal, individual. Unexpectedly taking family members to the ER two weeks ago. <laughs> That'll drain you. Some of them are world-spanning. I'm so glad, Bill, that you mentioned some of the good news coming out of the Ukraine, because I listen to the news, I watch the news, I, and it just, it just sucks the life out of you, all of the bad that is happening. Now, and, and this is not new. 
This is not unique. Now, if, you know, if we listen to the first few verses of Psalm 69, it begins with, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I come into deep water and the flood sweeps over me. I am weary with crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. It gets better. <laughs> Read the rest of the psalm. It gets better. But the psalmist felt this weariness. I, I did a word search looking for weary in the Bible. I expected it was going to be Jeremiah. I thought if I'm going to find anybody who's tired and down into his soul, it's going to be Jeremiah. Turns out it's Isaiah. <laughs> More, com more usages of the word weary by Isaiah than by, by Jeremiah. Um, this deep sense of being overwhelmed with the things, or overwhelmed with the things around us. Um, I don't know if the music group Jars of Clay was intentionally paraphrasing Psalm 69 or not, but in their song Flood, they wrote, My world is a flood, and slowly I become one with mud. We are running on empty. Now, the last time I was asked to preach, I looked at Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 19. And this is the event where John the Baptist is in prison, and as we know, he's ultimately executed in prison. But before he was killed, he sent his disciples to Jesus, asking, are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? Now, John knew who Jesus was. I mean, when Jesus came to him to be baptized, John protested. He refused. He said, if anyone's going to be baptized here, it should be me by you. I shouldn't be baptizing you. I... But John, in prison, he is weary. Jesus answers John's questions and sends John's messengers back to him. And picking up in verse 20, Matthew writes, Then Jesus began to denounce you know what, I'm going to jump right down to verse 25 as well. Matthew then uses this phrase, at that time. Now, as pretty much every commentator points out, these two phrases don't necessarily mean that Jesus said these things immediately, all right, right after John's disciples left. Now, this may not have been one long continuous speech by Jesus, in other words. Uh, you'll notice that in most modern printings of the Bible, these sections actually have little titles at the top of them that aren't part of the text, but they describe them. And that'll make them seem even more disconnected from each other you know, as, as you read it. This same condemnation that Matthew records, Luke also records it. Um, but the context in Luke is when Jesus has sent his disciples out on their own individual ministries. However, we do know from study of Matthew that his writing style is to connect things thematically as much as he does chronologically. So what that means then is that even if these three parts of Matthew chapter 11 didn't all happen bang, 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 one run after another, Matthew shows they're connected, they're related. They belong together in our understanding of, of Jesus and his ministry. And of course, I mean, keep in mind that the, all of these chapter and verse notations, they're not in what Matthew wrote. They're not in the original text. Those were added later by scribes as a way of annotating so they could tell each other, well, I'm looking at this section here. Right? Um, so these events, and continues on into chapter 12 as well, they're all connected to each other. So I want to then back up to verse 18. Let's go back even farther and start there, where Jesus is still talking about John. And he says, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by your deeds. Or to say it in modern 21st century English, there's just no pleasing some people. John looks and acts one way, Jesus another way. Both are rejected because they don't match what the leaders of the day thought God's messengers would be. And then we get to the denunciation of the cities. So, then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it would be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, 
Will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you, it would be more tolerable, tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. This is heavy stuff. I mean, these are the cities where Jesus spent most of his time when he was in Galilee. These are his centers of action while he's in the north of Israel. And they're contrasted with cities that are known for their rejection of God. Jesus is telling them, you've seen enough evidence that would have convinced even those sinful cities. But you've not repented. The prophet Jonah is sent to the city of Nineveh with a message of repentance by God. And one of the reasons that he didn't want to go, because he knew they would repent and that God would actually forgive them. Jonah had anger issues. (laughs) Jesus doesn't mention Nineveh here, probably because the people in Nineveh did in fact repent. Jonah was right. They repented when they heard the message. But he names three cities that are known for not repenting. These Galilean cities had every opportunity, still didn't repent. They wouldn't listen to John. It's too weird. Too much of an outsider. Too much wilderness in them, right? It's bugs. Strange guy. Right? They wouldn't listen to Jesus either. He's too familiar. He grew up here, right? He's too much in touch with the people. He's too common. They ignored the message because they didn't like the messengers. Yeah, I mean, we never do that, do we? Yeah, of course we do. (laughs) Notice that Jesus doesn't denounce the cities for rejecting him, though. He denounces them for not repenting. Now, that may not sound like much of a difference, but Harold Fowler, one of the missionaries that my family knew when we were working in Italy, wrote, theirs was a sin of inaction. Many a man's defense before God is no more than this but I didn't do anything. But this may in fact be his condemnation for Jesus had outlined the plan of action. Why wouldn't they repent? Why wouldn't these cities repent? Boils down to two things mostly, pride and an attitude of self-sufficiency, which is, you know, still kind of pride. <clears throat> the rhetorical question to Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven, is paralleled in Isaiah when he talks about the city of Babylon. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Isaiah is condemning Babylon's pride. Likewise, Pernodum probably had a similar attitude. I mean, after all, they're part of the people of Israel, God's chosen people. They keep the law. They follow the prophets. Surely there's no need for them to repent. That repentance stuff, that's that's for other people. And you know, this may have even carried over into people who liked Jesus, people who wanted to hear what he had to say. I mean, Jesus spent so much time in Capernaum that some people even call it Jesus' adopted hometown. (laughs) So, obviously, the people there are okay, right? They're fine. Jesus here makes it clear that proximity is not the same as repentance. There's no salvation by association. So, finally, I'm finished with that. We'll get down to that last section there and finally into this question of weariness. There were people who heard John's message and did repent. Likewise, people did follow Jesus. Some, for all their long, wrong reasons, as Grant talked about last week, the feeding of the 5,000 people really wanted to follow Jesus after that. You know, because free food. But some did follow due to true repentance. They are not, by and large, though, the leaders of the people of Israel at this time. Continuing in verse 25, we read, At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. 
and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Jesus begins this section by speaking directly to God, a, a little mini prayer in the middle of what he's saying overall. And notice he begins that prayer with thanksgiving. Kind of an odd thing. I mean, just, you know, these people are all terrible. Thank you, God. It seems like a strange little interlude there. But the contrast here is between the wise and understanding and the little children. Now, ask most people which they would prefer to be, and they'll likely say wise and understanding. I mean, it sure sounds better, right? There is nothing wrong with being wise, is there? I mean, you go through Proverbs, you'll find admonishment after admonishment to seek wisdom. James advises his reader, if any of you lack wisdom, ask God, who provides generously. Being wise and being understanding are universally recognized as virtues. So why does Jesus say he has hidden these things from the wise? And, and what are these things anyway? They are the works of God that Jesus has done among the cities. The works which they had been done elsewhere, had they been done elsewhere, would have resulted in widespread repentance. The wise and the understanding in this context are the people in the cities who are wise in their own eyes. Their understanding, by which we mean knowledge, has convinced them they already know all they need to know. I mean, it's the same problem of pride again. I see Jesse and Faith are here, sorry, for this next line. <laughs> the adage is, is that doctors make the worst patients. Uh, I know from experience as a teacher that we're terrible at admitting I don't know. These wise and understanding people are not going to seek wisdom because they think they've already found it. They won't ask God for wisdom because they believe they don't need it. In fact, they are so wise and so understanding that they have advice for God. You've probably met people like that. And it is from these people that God has hidden his work. I mean, they refuse to consider it anyway. Because of what happens in chapter 12, and because it's a recurring theme throughout the Gospels, there is a temptation to identify the wise and understanding with the Pharisees, the scribes and the teachers of the law. And certainly of them, many of them fit the bill. But the context here, what Jesus is saying is not about specific book knowledge, but about their attitude, about their hearts. They are not humble enough to learn. And this is not true of all the leaders of the people either. We know, for example, that while John was baptizing at the Jordan River, some of the priests came to be baptized. And we know that Nicodemus, a member of the Sanhedrin, came to Jesus to learn from him. And later, when the Sanhedrin is trying to put Jesus to death, Nicodemus says, we can't do this, not without a proper trial. We can't just condemn somebody out of hand. So the attitude of the heart is what's here, not the person's position in society. Now, by contrast, then, who are the little children? Well, they're the ones who display an openness to hearing God. This is not about immaturity, but a recognition of their own lack of understanding. My six-year-old will ask me questions almost every day. Questions that I don't know the answer to, and honestly, many times I have no way of knowing the answer to. There's something about kangaroos and the mass of Jupiter, and it was weird. Uh, probably had to be six to understand the question. <laughs> I don't know the answer to these questions, but he thinks that I do. <laughs> I am his go-to source of knowledge. And this has far less to do with how much he thinks I know and much more to do with his recognition of what he doesn't know. He's not full of his own answers. And therefore, he's ready and willing to learn from someone else. And it is that attitude which Jesus is praising in the little children to whom God has revealed himself. Finishing this little prayer of thanksgiving, Jesus then makes an extraordinary statement that all things have been handed over to him by the Father. Now that phrase, handed over, is used elsewhere in the Bible and refers to a situation of total control. In the context here, what has been handed over to Jesus? All knowledge of the Father. Jesus is making a claim of exclusivity. No one 
knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. This is an astounding claim, one that people today reject. Well, there's got to be other ways to, to know if God's real or not. There's got to be other ways to know what's right. No. <laughs> Jesus is making a claim of exclusivity here. And this is one that people in Jesus' own time period also rejected. When Jesus told the Jewish leaders, the Father and I are one, he almost got stoned to death on the spot. At the Last Supper, Jesus tells his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, there's that phrase again, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Philip responds to this by saying, well, show us the Father. You can almost see Jesus kind of going, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. <laughs> Didn't I just say that, Philip? <laughs> and it's on the basis of this astounding claim, then, that Jesus extends the invitation. That is the, the center of this, this passage here. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Labor and loads and rest. And how is all this connected to the preceding verses? Well, Jesus is not talking about normal day-to-day -day fatigue. As much as I wanted this verse to be about that, <laughs> I spent a whole week struggling with that. It's not about normal day-to-day -day fatigue. This is not about the aches and pains of everyday life. Though those are real, right? And we do often find that our work and our life grinds us down and physically, mentally, and emotionally. Here, however, Jesus is addressing people who are seeking God. People who are seeking the Father. And they are ground down spiritually. You see, they got a problem. If they try to measure themselves against God's perfection, they will fail every time. That is labor that will never be successful. So you fake it. You make yourself look perfect. And that's its own trap. Because once you've got this image up, I'm perfect, everything's great, you can never let it drop, can you? I asked Grant if he'd seen the cartoon movie Encanto. He hasn't. But there's a character in the film who seems to have a perfect life. And the main character is terribly jealous of this person's perfect life. And in a confrontation, the person with the perfect life admits, I'm trapped by my seeming perfection. I can't make any mistakes. I can't be human. Because I've got to be perfect. In the specific context of Israel at that time period, there's an added layer to this problem. You see, the religious leaders of the day had made additional rules and additional standards and ceremonies that people were expected to measure up to. God has his rules. Our standards are a little bit higher. <laughs> uh, Jesus rebuked these experts in the law by saying, you load people down with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. In the very next section of Matthew, right after this, we have two events presented back to back where the Pharisees attack Jesus for violating their interpretation of the Sabbath law. See, they held their interpretation of the law as equal to the law itself. And they'd convinced most of the people of Israel that that was right. So they believed it too. And so in contrast to this, Jesus offers them rest. Rest from this perfection. Rest from these unattainable standards. He says, take my yoke upon you. Now, a yoke does not sound very restful. <laughs> In the agricultural tools of the day, a yoke referred to this wooden collar around that the oxen would wear, and then the wagons were attached to the yoke, and then the oxen could pull the wagon, or the plow, or you know, whatever it is you wanted them to pull. You know, that sounds like hard work, not rest. But this is not a bait and switch. See, the problem is we have a twisted view of work. There is a meme which asks, what is your dream job? And the reply is, I don't dream of labor. I mean, it's funny, but it's not scriptural. Go back to Genesis again. When humans are created, God gives them a job to do. 
And this is before sin enters the world. So in a perfect, sinless world, we'd still have work to do. Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes, there is nothing better for a person to do than that he should eat, drink, and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. Now that word toil doesn't sound like much fun. But Solomon points out, even in a broken world, we can enjoy our work. Work is not the problem. Work is not an aspect of a sinful world. You know, there are aspects of my job as a high school teacher that I really enjoy. And there are aspects that are toil. But it's not the, the work that is the problem there. So why is Jesus asking us to put on his yoke? Well, now culturally at the time, there's also the connotation of a yoke as obedience to the law. That a yoke symbolized this. But the leaders of Israel had made that into something much more burdensome than it should be. I mean, have you ever had to do a job with the wrong tools? You ever turned a screw with a coin because you couldn't find a screwdriver? Cut through a branch with your dad's hacksaw because you couldn't find the wood saw? Sorry, Dad. You ever stood on top of a box on top of a chair because you couldn't find a ladder? Yeah, all of these will work. You'll get the job done. But none of them work well, and they all make the job harder. As a high school student, I went on a camping canoe trip. And the camp we left from had two kinds of canoes that we could use. One was aluminum. It was very light. The other was made out of wooden fiberglass. And those canoes were very heavy. <laughs> On the trip, we had to go on a portage several times. This meant that we took all of our bags and sleepy bags and tents out of the canoes, flipped the canoes upside down, carried them on our shoulders from one lake to the next. Some of the portages were pretty short. The longest one was about five kilometers. Now, being able to carry a canoe solo was a point of pride for me and for many of the other of my classmates on this trip. The lightweight aluminum canoes had a simple crossbar in the middle that helped give the canoe shape and strength. That bar sat on my shoulders as I carried it, and it hurt. <clears throat> it was rounded. It didn't have any sharp corners on it. But just that bar pressing down into my neck and shoulders became intolerable on the longer portages, so much so that I had to put it down on the ground and rest while I massaged out my shoulders. The heavy fiberglass canoes, on the other hand, had a wooden yoke in them instead of a simple crossbar. Now, this thing was contoured to fit around a person's neck and shoulders, and it distributed the weight more easily, more evenly, rather, more evenly. The canoe was still heavy, but it was easier to carry than the aluminum one. The right tool makes even a difficult job easier. Now, it was even easier if I didn't solo the canoe at all. <laughs> right? I fell during one of our portages while carrying a canoe by myself. And after helping me carry it the rest of the way through the portage, one of my classmates scolded me, gently. Karen was nice that way. But she scolded me for carrying it solo. She rightly pointed out to me there was no reason for me to do this alone. Go back to those two oxen yoked in ancient times. They're typically yoked in pairs. Two were stronger together than one, and neither one of them had to bear the full weight of the load alone. So Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. He's offering us a better yoke than any we'd ever make for ourselves. Better yoke than anyone would make for us. Yes, a yoke is a symbol of control, of obligation, of even bondage. Paul will describe himself as a slave to Christ. The yoke, however, is not the end of Jesus' offer. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. What do we need to learn from Jesus? Well, as, as Harold Fowler observed, everything. But that's why it's so comforting that Jesus is gentle and humble in heart. As the writer of the letters to the Hebrews puts it, he is able to sympathize with our weaknesses because he was tempted as we are but did not sin. When Jesus says to us, I know what you're going through, it's not lip service or hollow words. He has been there. He understands our struggles. He understands how hard this is for us. And so he can teach us in a gentle way. 
and yet most people will not accept this offer. We want to be self-sufficient. We want to do it on our own. I'll get to Jeremiah here eventually. <laughs> Jeremiah, describing the imminent destruction of Jerusalem, says, Thus says the Lord, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the, way is, where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? <laughs> There's the good path. Nope, I'm going to make my own. <sighs> Rest for your souls is how Jeremiah phrases this. It's the same thing that Jesus is saying here. People in this time reject it. People in our time reject it. Bill, you can bring the team on back up. See, rest for our souls is what we need. Not rest <coughs> from work, because God created us to have purpose and action but rest from meaningless works that we do to try and make ourselves good enough. Rest from this performance of perfection that we put on for everyone else. I didn't need to solo that canoe. We don't need to solo whatever it is that we're carrying today either. And the only source of that rest, no matter where we look for it, the only source of that rest is God and it is only through Jesus that we can know the Father. So we need to seek Jesus. God wants to give us that rest. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That invitation is as open to us today as it was to those who first heard it. We cannot, though, receive that rest unless we're willing to accept his yoke and his instruction. But his yoke is going to be better than anything else we find. Thanks, Joel. So let us come to him. Come to the table. Acknowledge him for who he is. Acknowledge him for the one who has the right to tell us what to do.
Thank you, Father, for the, the gift of your Son, who is the only way to you, that you have provided us that access. You have provided us a means, and a way, and an example, a gentle and humble teacher to bring us to you and a Savior. That we are not bound by our own attempts at perfection or other people's standards but are covered by his sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen.